Dear partners, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, uh, good afternoon in the Pacific and uh, a very good evening in the Americas. This week we should all have been in Lisbon following the Ocean Conference, but we are here. We are here because we will not leave the COVID-19 pandemic take off the momentum that we do have for Ocean Action. So I would like to welcome you to the third webinar of the 2020 United Nations OSEAN Conference on keeping the momentum for OSEAN action, Asia-Pacific stakeholders' participation and engagement. My name is Stefanos Fotiu. I'm the director of the Environment and Development Division in UNESCO, and I'm very honored to be your moderator for this session. Before we begin, I would like to provide some housekeeping announcements. First, we kindly ask participants to mute their microphones and to turn their cameras off during the session. During the interactive segment, selected participants will be invited to take the floor for two minutes intervention. When your name and organizations are called, you may unmute your microphone and turn your video on that point. Participants may use the chat box future to make comments or questions through the session. And this chat will be monitored and we will try to accommodate your inputs during or after the seminar. We have a very substantive agenda today. Uh, after our opening remarks from myself and my colleagues in UNDESA, we'll have a keynote address by Ambassador Thompson. We will then welcome three speakers to ignite this conversation focusing on marine plastic pollution and ocean climate synergies. The presentations will be followed by an interactive dialogue where stakeholders are welcome to engage in these discussions. Now it's my pleasure to invite my colleague, Ms. Lota Tachtinen, Chief of the Outreach and Partnership Branch of the Division of Sustainable Development Goals in the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs to deliver welcome remarks. Dear Lota, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues, uh, and thank you for joining this uh, web webinar uh, that we are so pleased to be organizing with our colleagues from ESCAP on keeping the momentum for ocean action, for mobilizing uh, in particular stakeholders in Asia and the Pacific. And a warm greeting to all of you uh, from uh, New York on behalf of myself and all of our uh, DESA colleagues who are also joining this call. Um, now, uh, dear colleagues, um, even though the 2020 UN Ocean Conference has unfortunately been postponed uh, because of the ongoing COVID-19 uh, crisis, the preparatory process is continuing uh, under the leadership uh, of the two co-hosts, Kenya and uh, Portugal. In preparation uh, for the Ocean Conference, um, the Division for the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, where I work um, at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, has been promoting and organizing a series of activities, uh, including uh, online consultations and open webinars uh, to bring perspectives from stakeholders representing different sectors and regions to keep the momentum towards ocean action. Even though at this point we do not yet know uh, the, the dates uh, for the conference when it will be held, uh, we expect it to be held uh, sometime during the course of next year. Uh, we hope that through these events that we are convening, uh, we can connect and mobilize stakeholders and bring new ideas towards the preparation and uh, outreach of the conference. And we particularly hope that we can ignite and inspire all of you to register new commitments for ocean action, which are expected to be an important outcome of the ocean conference. Today's webinar is a third in a series uh, that uh, our uh, department has been organizing. 
the first webinar, uh, which was held just a few weeks ago, uh, focused on hearing the voices of youth. And a second webinar uh, we have organized uh, um, was with the private sector. The recordings of both these events, if you are interested, um, which engaged a more global audience, are available on the 2020 Ocean Conference website. Today, we are particularly delighted to be hearing from stakeholders in the Asia Pacific region. And I would really very warmly like to acknowledge and thank the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific for the partnership and great support in hosting today's call. I also want to acknowledge the great collaboration uh, of the United Nations Non-Governmental Liaison Service, UNNGLS. We are delighted uh, to have a video message uh, from Ambassador Peter Thompson, who is the United Nations Secretary General Special Envoy on Oceans. We're also pleased that this webinar will include a session where we can hear from Asia-Pacific stakeholders on some of the most pressing environmental challenges in the Asia-Pacific region, in particular marine plastic pollution and ocean and climate synergies, and hear your ideas on how we can support implementation of SDG 14 moving forward. We are delighted to have such a great uh, um, uh, participation uh, online um, attending this webinar, and we very much look forward to hearing your views and recommendations. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Lothar, for your very warm and welcoming words. Um, just a small reminder, um, dear uh, participants, please turn off your camera and mute your microphone when you don't have the floor. Um, so, uh, Lotta, I would like also on behalf of ESCAP to thank um, DESA very much uh, and, of course, the organizers of the UN conference for your invitation to co-host this webinar to keep the momentum alive in Asia and the Pacific. In Asia and the Pacific, we have done the agenda of OSEA, a very central piece of the work of UNESCO. Before we proceed, I would like to show a very brief video to highlight the importance of the OSEAN for uh, the Asia-Pacific region and the work we are doing in the ESCAP Secretariat to conserve and protect the OSEAN. While Asia and the Pacific face an unprecedented moment, our region cannot lose sight of its long-term goals. At this 76th session of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, we will also focus on another priority area, our oceans. Specifically, delegates will deliberate on this theme, promoting economic, social and environmental cooperation on oceans for sustainable development. At least 200 million people in Asia and the Pacific depend on oceans for their livelihood. Oceans are fundamental to economic development and also bring harmony between people and the planet. But overfishing, maritime shipping and a crisis of pollution is putting this essential shared resource at risk. Conserving the oceans is sustainable development goal number 14. And to deliver on this promise, we need to accelerate action. Going forward, we must promote sustainable fishing, improve maritime connectivity, reduce pollution and plastic waste, and broaden access to ocean statistics and data. Getting this process right is fundamental to achieving the entire 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. If we succeed in delivering SDG number 14, there will be a multiplier effect upon the success of other SDGs. So let's endeavor to preserve and protect this vital shared environmental and economic resource for future generations. The inhabitants living above and below the water depend on it.
So thank you very much to the colleagues that they have prepared the video. And um, at, at this point, uh, let me tell you that uh, our member states in uh, Asia and the Pacific has given ESCAP a very clear mandate to continue working on the protection and the conservation of the ocean. And um, in ESCAP, we will continue to support governments working closely with civil society organizations, academia, the scientific community, and the private sector to make progress towards the delivery of SDG 14. And I have to admit here, and uh, I would like to highlight that on creating this work stream in ESCAP and having our member states uh, massively supporting additional work on ocean, uh, there was a pivotal person that steered us towards this direction. And that person is the, uh, His Excellency the Ambassador Peter Thompson, uh, which we would have the, the very big pleasure to give us a keynote address today. Um, Ambassador Thompson needs no introduction. You all know him very well from his continued decades long work on OSEAN uh, that uh, culminated on uh, being appointed in 2017 as the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the OSEAN. As he was unable to join us live today, he has kindly sent us a video message for all of us. Uh, colleagues, please, let's have the video of the ambassador. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all courtesies observed and greetings to all as we gather here in cyberspace. I hope that whatever your circumstance, that you and your families are safe and well. And I trust that everyone is finding it in their hearts to exercise the best of human traits, of sharing, of empathy, of kindness to our fellows and those who are suffering the most in our communities as a consequence of this pandemic. I thank my colleagues in ESCAP and UNDESA for organizing this webinar with a view to our getting together to maintain the momentum of the ocean action movement that is supporting the implementation of SDG 14, the ocean goal that sets out to conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources. It's true that the super year for the ocean has been disrupted by the coronavirus pandemic. All the great environmental conferences planned for 2020 for biodiversity, the climate crisis, and for the ocean have been postponed. But no more than that. The conferences will be held as soon as conditions allow, and we will gather at them in real and virtual format to deliberate for we remain resolutely committed to the multilateral process aimed at securing a sustainable way of life on this planet. In the meantime, we have a responsibility to maintain the momentum and where required, endeavor to meet the targets set by international agreement. Preparations for the UN Ocean Conference continue on a step-by-step -step basis with dates to be announced in due course on when the conference will be held. The location of the conference is still going to be in the beautiful harbor city of Lisbon in Portugal. And the co-hosts, Portugal and Kenya, are resolute in their determination to host a vibrant conference that will break new ground for the innovation and science required to successfully implement SDG 14. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen, gathered in virtual proximity to discuss how we can best maintain the momentum for ocean action. Welcome everyone to this webinar and I trust you will find it to be a useful part of your working week. We'll be delving in particular into two issues that are critical for the well-being of the ocean in our Asia Pacific region, namely marine plastic pollution and ocean climate synergies. It is only right that we should address the marine plastic uh, issue for this, uh, in this regard, Southeast Asia and East Asia have been identified as the worst affected regions on the planet. When it comes to the ocean climate nexus, again, we find ourselves at the front lines, for the great majority of the world's coral is found in Asia Pacific, and many of our member states are either low-lying island countries or have long stretches of low-lying arable and residential coastal lands. One of the chief effects of global warming is, of course, uh, the warming of the ocean uh, and uh, with that climate change. And the warming of the ocean leads inexorably to the death of coral and rising sea levels. Covering 70% of the Earth's surface, 
absorbing 25% of all CO2 emissions, 90% of the heat generated by our greenhouse gas emissions. The ocean is the planet's largest biosphere and climate regulator. Yet the ocean's intricate link with climate change and biodiversity loss, as well as its central role in providing food, energy, jobs, and pharmaceuticals is still not sufficiently recognized. So ladies and gentlemen, we all know that governments and corporations are facing very difficult decisions at this time of planning and managing the economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. We must face the fact that prolonged global economic slowdown runs the associated risk of reducing commitment to climate action. This cannot be allowed to happen. I've already provided two examples, the death of coral and rising sea levels, as to why that should not be countenanced. So while we're still in the grip of this paralyzing pandemic, we should all be examining with great care the roots of economic recovery upon which we will soon be embarking. I firmly believe it is at this time that our voices should be heard in favor of the high road to a clean green transition, a road I call the blue-green recovery road. I know it's hard for decision makers and breadwinners to think long term when the short term exigencies of crisis and supply management are priority. But this is the time when decisions on massive financial commitments are in train. And before the seal is set upon them, we have to ensure that the consequences of taking a low road back to the global warming, fossil fuel dependent, plastic polluting world we knew are understood and avoided. In the name of our children, I urge governments and development banks and agencies and corporations to think of our long-term responsibilities and invest now in clean blue-green infrastructure for a better future for people and planet. I urge you to think about the six principles that UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres laid down in his Earth Day address earlier this year. Principles that included ending fossil fuel subsidies, polluters being made to pay for their pollution, and the investment of public funds into a future of sustainable projects that help the environment and the climate. Ladies and gentlemen, we've always known that humans and nature are part of one connected system, with nature providing us our water and air, medicine, food, and so many more benefits. But lately, we've been riding roughshod over those benefits, taking nature too much for granted, disguising greed in costumes of profit and progress. In these days of reflection, we should remind ourselves that since ancient times, philosophers have urged respect and balance in our relationship with the natural world. In the end, the ocean's well-being depends on the drastic lowering of our greenhouse gas emissions. If you care about the ocean's health, care about those emissions, for from them we witness ocean acidification, deoxygenation, and warming. Self-interest of our species demands that unprecedented reductions in anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions around the world shape the recovery roads ahead. Only then will we reverse the decline of the ocean's health and best secure our own. The role of innovation in securing those reductions is inescapable. And we are already seeing positive signs of this and everything from offshore renewable energy to the greening of shipping. Innovation will allow us to move from linear exploitation of finite planetary resources into an era of circular economies, sustainable food systems, and resilient cities. And it will lead us to better safeguarding of the biodiversity of nature upon which our lives ultimately depend. In the Asia Pacific context, today's webinar is timely. ESCAP member states recently gathered in an unprecedented virtual commission session in which they called upon all relevant stakeholders to take urgent actions for the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean. That call included the encouragement at the regional level of policies to reduce marine pollution, strengthen cooperation and policy coherence, and to promote synergy between Goal 13 on climate action and Goal 14 on ocean action bring positive action to fine words, I was glad to note that the Member States requested the SCAP Secretariat to continue its work in strengthening partnerships, including participatory and multi-stakeholder dialogue platforms. I'd also like to bring attention to SCAP's recent study, Changing Skills, Accelerating Regional Actions for Sustainable Oceans in Asia and the Pacific, which highlights the importance of the ocean for life in the Asia-Pacific region. 
and underscores the need to accelerate action on plastic pollution and the climate crisis. Acceleration of action is integral to our call for the investment of public funds into sustainable projects envisaged for the Blue-Green Recovery Road. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude my remarks, I recall that the last time I was in Bangkok was to speak at the Asia Pacific Day for the Ocean, and I was very inspired that day by the commitment I observed from our youth and from our NGOs. Please don't think I'm being glib when I say it is that kind of commitment which gives me the fuel I need to push ahead with my ocean action work. So I encourage you all to tell the world about your goals and your determination by going to the UN Ocean Conference website and entering more Asia-Pacific voluntary con uh, commitments into the register that is maintained for this purpose at the UN. I hope to convene again with you on ocean issues this week at the virtual ocean dialogues being organized courtesy of the World Economic Forum. Registration for the dialogues is free. You can do that online. And the topics covered relate to all of our SDG 14 concerns. And I fully expect to work further with you in preparations for the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And of course, I look forward to convening with you both in person and virtually at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon. The challenge to faithfully implement the targets of SDG 14 is a global one, but Asia Pacific has a huge role to play in meeting it. As we say in Fiji, tamusoro, no surrender, and I thank you for your attention. We thank you very much, and I would like to uh, give my sincere appreciation to Ambassador Peter Thompson for his um, remarks. Um, as he uh, eloquently put it, tabu soro, we will not surrender in Asia Pacific, and actually we will look how we will do uh, Asia Pacific, the champion on the protection and conservation of the ocean. And of course, we are looking forward to hosting him and all of you during the third Asia Pacific Day for the ocean, which uh, we are planning to uh, put uh, someday the week of 8 to 11 December this year, if everything will go well. So after these uh, motivating messages, I would like to begin with our first round of speakers to start the discussion on marine plastic pollution and ocean climate synergies. We will begin with Professor Brayes Dubey, who has nearly 20 years of experience in research, teaching, training, and industrial outreach, and has authored and co-authored more than 200 publications. He's one of the lead authors of the blue paper submission by the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy, leveraging multi-target strategies to address plastic pollution in the context of an already stressed ocean. Professor Brothers, the floor is yours, and I would appreciate if you keep your intervention to seven minutes maximum, and I will give you marks at the two minutes uh, time. Thank you very much. Professor Brazes, maybe you have to unmute your phone and turn on your camera. Yeah, can you can you share my screen? Can you see see my screen? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Okay. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, based on where you are. So. As uh, introduced, I'll be talking about the blue paper that we recently did uh, as part of this uh, high-level panel for sustainable ocean economy. Uh, if you, uh, just to give you a brief background, this uh, high-level panel was established in September 2018. Uh, it's, uh, it's a unique initiative of uh, 14 world leaders which are committed to catalyzing bold, pragmatic ocean solutions in uh, governance, technology, and finance. And it is supporting those sustainable development goals that we just heard about uh, in the previous uh, speaker. And it's trying to create a relationship between the humanity and ocean, allowing us to protect, produce, and prosper. So this uh, uh, high-level panel, uh, the Secretariat is based in World Resource Institute. And we are very much thankful for all the support that we have received from this uh, uh, World Resource Institute in terms of putting this uh, blue paper out uh, um, 
so as i mentioned there are uh, this coming from uh, 14 world leaders and you just heard uh, peter thompson he is also part of this uh, high level panel uh, in terms of uh, sustainable ocean economy so this is the paper that uh, was just uh, mentioned uh, uh, that we are looking at uh, plastic pollution so we are taking that uh, taking this to address the plastic pollution in in the context of already <laughs> Yes. So we are trying to address the plastic pollution in the context of already stressed ocean. Uh, you will be have copies of this blue paper as well as the summary of decision makers uh, after this uh, uh, event is over. You will have it. So we are three main lead authors on this blue paper. Dr. Jenna Jambak, uh, who uh, is professor at University of Georgia, she is our lead author and actually the team leader for this work. And Ellie Moss and myself, uh, we are the three lead authors, but we had authors from uh, almost uh, different, uh, uh, all, almost all the planets of this uh, of uh, Earth. So just to give you that we, it was represented uh, from different places, different countries around the world. So just to get uh, directly into, uh, in terms of uh, plastic, and then I'll talk about some other pollution as well. So just to give you a few numbers, uh, five to 13 million metric ton of plastic uh, goes into ocean each year, which is kind of equivalent to one dump truck of plastic per minute. This data came out from the paper that uh, the, our Jenna Jembak did that in 2015. It is already out uh, uh, in, uh, you, can, you can have access to that. So plastic in the environment and ocean, they're endangered fish, they're turtles, shark, seabirds, whales, dolphins, and numerous other marine animals as we know that. And they also pollute uh, the beaches. So that it is estimated that cost to that even the UNEP estimated that global damage to marine environment uh, from plastic pollution cost a minimum of around 13 billion per year. 3% uh, of the ocean plastic is floating, but there are a lot of plastics which is uh, there in the ocean floor. Around nearly 2 million microplastics per square meter is there on the ocean floor, creating a lot of pollution. But plastic is not the only pollution which is getting into the ocean. So because of all the different uh, activities that is uh, happening around the plastic, a lot of attention has gone on visible plastic and clean up on the surface. But uh, as, as you know, that's not only the only uh, pollutant. So in this paper, we took a close look at ocean pollution beyond plastic waste, including pesticides, heavy metals, oil and gas, non-plastic solid waste, antibiotics, pesticides, parasitized, and other pharmaceuticals, nutrients, industrial chemicals, including uh, POPs that persistent organic pollutants. As you can see in this particular picture, uh, the, because of the anthropogenic activities and uh, there are different things uh, like we, we do in terms of uh, our sewage treatment plant, our agricultural activities, waste management, maritime activities, shipping, oil platform, industries, everything ultimately leads to some pollution getting into the ocean because that's kind of the sink for different pollutions uh, that happens uh, uh, from different uh, parts of our activity. So sectors are municipal sectors, agricultural sectors, aquacultural, industrial, maritime. We may not realize, but even the if you don't manage the plastic waste properly in, in your own town or in your own villages, that plastic will end up in the ocean and which we have, which as we are seeing for last couple of decades now. So what we have tried to do in this particular paper is to try to have a, a holistic approach. And we looked at all these different pollutants like microplastics, which is uh, less than five millimeters, macroplastic, which is greater than five, other solid waste, pesticides, nutrients, antibiotics, heavy metals, oil and gas, and all those different sources. And we looked also at the impact, like in terms of impact in three broader categories, impact on ocean, impact on health, human health and environment, impact on the economy. So in terms of ocean, you know, the species are getting entangled. You see so many YouTube videos these days. Uh, if you just uh, Google or you go on YouTube, you'll find several videos which shows your Great Pacific Garbage Patch and several other patches. Then transport of chemicals, uh, and uh, it's not only the plastic, it is the chemicals, other chemicals which is present with plastic as a different binders or uh, uh, some of uh, the pigments. Then the ghost fish fishing from the fishing nets, eutrophication, lack of oxygen, biomagnification. So all these are impacting ocean. And that leads to uh, impact on health in terms of reproductive uh, acute uh, toxicity, increased exposure. And then ultimately it leads to economy because of loss of seafood supply, lost values of resources that rather can be used as a circular economy, reduce tourism and recreation. So what we try to Professor do is- Professor Brazil, you have two more minutes. Sure, sure. 
So in terms of the solution, so the, we have identified the problem, then we looked at the solutions. The solutions, we have come up with these seven broad ideas, looking at improving the wastewater uh, management, improve storm water, adopt green chemistry practices, radical resource efficiency, recover, recycle, improve coastal zones, and build local systems for safe food and water. I'll not go over this slide in detail. You can read it in the paper, which is there. But basically, we have tried to identify all the different SDGs that was being talked about in the previous presentation and how the intervention coming from municipal agricultural, industrial, maritime. So it's basically has to have a multi-sector approach uh, and kind of have a good uh, teamwork to uh, help in terms of uh, removing this pollution from our ocean. So it is an opportunity for action. So for each of these, uh, each of these uh, uh, seven sectors, we have identified uh, action. I'll, uh, for the interest of time, I'll not go in detail, but we have looked into infrastructure, we looked into the policy, we looked at the chain, what need to be done in terms of mindset and what kind of innovations is required in uh, in all these different uh, interventions that is uh, needed in terms of improving wastewater, adopting green chemistry practices, uh, looking at uh, radical resource efficiency, recover, recycle the material that we are using. And uh, so all these things in great detail or almost close to 70 pages is, uh, is our paper, uh, which will be made available to you. You can download it from uh, oceanpanels.org website as well. So. Uh, that's what I wanted to give a very brief overview on behalf of uh, all my co-authors. So thank you. And if there is any question later on, I'll be happy to take. Thank you very much, Professor Bragis, for your insights. Um, of course, um, the participants are looking forward to reading your papers. And we will make sure that we will share the details of your paper and um, every other detail. Uh, colleagues, please, I would like to ask that the ones that they are not speaking, they are turning off their camera and their microphone because we have interventions. Um, I would like now to welcome our second speaker, Ms. Fitriah Iskada, who is the president of the Sea Angle of Indonesia, Chapter Pontianak. Um, and this is an organization that promotes multiple stakeholder engagement and facilitates innovation in addressing solid waste and marine debris. Uh, Mrs. Kadar, be before I give you the floor, can I ask Mr. Thomas Matthew to turn off his screen? Thank you very much. Mrs. Kadar, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Stefanos. And good morning for everyone. My name is Fitria. I am from Indonesia, from Sindhu, Indonesia. And today I want to share for a glance about marine plastic pollution and my work in Indonesia. And just let's start it now. Um, according to United Nations, it, it's around 80% of ocean plastic comes from land-based sources, which is, you can see here mentioned, that rivers as a source for global marine plastic pollution. This is proven by a study that shows 10 top-ranked rivers that transport more than 80% of uh, plastic waste into the sea, and eight of them in the Asia. If these current trends keep continue, so it will probably the ocean will be full of plastic rather than fish in 2050. And how about in Indonesia? It, I got number 24 and 500 tons plastic produced for a day. And because of lack of waste management, it only end up in the landfill or even like into the water systems. As you can see here, I'm trying to show the example of landfill in Pontianak. It, which is in my city that using open dumping system and there are a lot of people live around there as scavengers. And for the policies, laws and regulations, actually Indonesian government um, already adopted the Indonesian plans of action uh, marine the beast that aims to reducing the the plastic marine debris by 70% in the end of 2025, but it still have challenge to implementation, monitoring, and enforcing the regulation and law itself. Example, like the, the paid plastic bag, which is um, the government tried to impu impose um, around $0.02 for each single-use plastic, but it had but it has a problem, like the retailers refuse to extend it because they say it affects their business and there's, um, there is no strong legal basis. On the other hand, the customer um, just complaining, where, where, will the, where, where did the money go? Because of the lack of clarity of the money itself. And for the technologies for uh, waste management, um, almost for the plastic recycling, it's still 
um, not have an adequate technology. So it's hand, mostly handled by informal or like community small scale or like NGOs like us. And here's um, the we have a longest river in Indonesia. It's Kapuas River. For 100 years, people lived there as a vital source um, for living. Even you can see there are a lot of human waste alongside the river. And people use the river for swimming, for take a bath, washing clothes, for fish ponds, and I'm sorry, for pee and poo too. It's like very, very horrible. And what we need to wear, we are talking about the environmental impact here. Of course, the plastic waste, uh, huge plastic waste, waste can um, make a clog water system, can cause a flood and make unhealthy environment for us. And for specifically in health impact for several studies show that for long-term microplastic um, impact can lead to cancer promoting the cancer and for economic impact can lead to um, plastic crisis if there's no adequate uh, plastic management in the future. And what we can do here, I want to share um, and highlight about the individual work that we can start from ourselves. Like maybe you can, if you can take part in environment movement, that would be good. But if you cannot, that would be good too. You can give donation, support bands, do recycle, stand for campaign, especially in this pandemic situation that you can use your power, uh, social media power to spread the awareness about the plastic um, problem. And yeah, that would be good because um, this pandemic limiting us as a volunteer to um, engage in the direct action, like clean up the beach or some activities related to it. And here I want to share, uh, introduce you about our organization in Indonesia. Single Indonesia, it's a based on 2017. Now we have a seven chapters, and I'm alone in the Borneo Island. Um, it's released on 2019, um, single Indonesia chapter Pontiana. And yeah, we have a hashtag fight for clean ocean. And here's our programs, main programs for the national scale that um, actually it's flexible for us to adopt it because every chapter is facing different challenges and circumstances like Pontianak doesn't have beach or near to the ocean so we only have river so yeah we can uh, I, I try to innovate it with something that can relate to it and here's what we've done not a lot but we still um, do our best especially um, opening the collaborations uh, with communities and stakeholders in environment projects. And this is um, highlight for our national scale activities. The dolphin is our recycling uh, product made from paper. And here is my chapter um, activities. Uh, mostly we are engaged in education activities and clean up. And the center is our recycling product, recycling notes. For the solution, I'm referring uh, to um, an EP documents uh, talking about reducing marine plastic pollution. And this is very, very comprehensive uh, chart, I think. And for what I wanted to highlight about how to enhance the stakeholders and uh, government uh, work, I think there are two um, there are two things that need to be aware. First one, um, there need to be improving in regulation and laws itself. As I uh, observe that low us uh, not um, weak regulations it's not really help us to reduce the behavior of single use plastic that uh, can litter in the environment and the second collaboration between the stakeholders the plastic producers on the government itself because we are work, uh, working into the one same goal why we're we not uh, trying to work together and i think um the ocean conference uh, can be a good good moments for us to share what is the biggest challenge that we still have facing or what is the newest challenge that um, we just know that it will be happen and yeah i hope the ocean conference will be uh, held soon after this pandemic to give uh to give more brainstorming about the solutions for the um, marine plastic pollution itself and if someone asks me about um, bioplastic i cannot stand clearly about it because beside the pros it's, argument it's got two minutes more Okay, thank you. Uh, because we said the pros arguments, I will tell about the 
counts argument which is telling us about uh, some bioplastic need certain circumstances to be degradable and if it's not degradable properly or if, if it's not fit to the criteria it will only end up same like the conventional plastic and of course it will just um, make a new danger to our environment especially in a marine environment and for if there's someone again ask me about a uh, plastic for energy yeah well i think it's a good idea because as i know plastic is hydrocarbon that made from petroleum which is can convert to energy but i'm sure that it's still a long way journey to us to uh, find alternative way such as alternative energy to change the um, fuel, uh, fossil fuel energy to reducing the climate change, but the plastic is still um, becoming our problem together. What we need to highlight here, I think the first one is to change our behavior to use something that over and over, especially in plastic, not using, not um, using single use plastic, but can we change, in, change it into a reusable bag or something that we can bring our uh, bottle to anywhere we can do it's like small small things that we can do like i said before it's a stop from individual but i'm sure we are we still need a huge step like for the regulations collaboration itself to um tackling the marine plastic pollution itself all right i think that's all from me uh thank you i'm giving back to stefano uh, thank you very much, Ms. Iskadar, for that presentation. Very pleased to learn about the commitments of your organization and very pleased to see how you connect local action with uh, national level action. I will ask you now to please uh, stop sharing your screen and um, uh, I will introduce our following speaker, which is Join Link from Fiji, Mr. Raid Ali. Uh, he is the representative of the Alliance for Future Generations and uh, he actively participates in various educational and awareness social activities, including public advocacy events, as well as in the policy space on climate change and marine pollution. Mr. Ali, the floor is yours for seven minutes. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Please proceed. Okay. Um, so, my name is Raidali, and I'm the project officer in a local NGO called the Alliance for Future Generations Fiji. And I'm also a member of uh, Yango Oceans Group. Yango is the official youth constituency of the UNFCCC. What we essentially do is we champion the voice and meaningful participation of young people in Fiji and the Pacific towards sustainable development efforts. And we do this by mobilizing, engaging, educating, and empowering young people and becoming protagonists of change in their individual lives homes, communities, and nation. We undertake strategic projects, activities, and campaigns that create a ripple of effects that benefits all people, including, including those who are marginalized in society. Today, our ocean is an epicenter for some of the most severe impacts of climate change, including sea level rise, ocean acidification, coastal erosion, saltwater intrusion, and extreme weather events. It is, in, it is clear that the climate crisis conversation cannot happen without the discussion of the oceans. Fiji, alongside other large ocean states, is at the forefront of climate and ocean change. Here in Fiji, there are communities that have already had to relocate as a result of sea level rise, inundation of tides, and increased intensity of storm surges. We have had four villages, we have had four village communities already relocated as a result of sea level rise, and close to 80 more communities that have been identified and earmarked for relocation, which will redirect much needed government resources. Coping with and adapting to the challenges of the climate change is a daily reality for many communities in Fiji, as elsewhere across the Pacific. And communities respond with a variety of adaptation techniques using indigenous knowledge systems. Among these different approaches, planned relocation in Fiji is a relatively new response to the effects of climate change, and one that is viewed as an option of last resort. Relocation is a complex process and often traumatic for those involved. It involves much more than simply rebuilding houses in a safe location. Full and engaged community participation is essential in any relocation project, as we must be culturally sensitive and hear the aspiration and concerns of our people. To the people of Fiji and the Pacific, the ocean is of great cultural significance, as we share a symbiotic relationship. The ocean is us and we are the ocean. 
we have always relied on it as a source of sustenance as an, and as a means of connection from one island to another and to each other. But now our oceans are heating up. And in Fiji, we have seen the impact of mass coral bleaching. Fishes are migrating to deeper oceans and our fishermen and fisherwomen now have to go into much deeper waters to find sufficient catch for their daily sustenance, often at the risk of their lives. Plastic pollution is another compounding threat. A recent study by, by a University of the South Pacific Master of Science student found that more than 65% of fish in Fiji waters contain microplastic. As custodians of the oceans, young people here have recognized the important role of the ocean, not only as a sustainer of life and ecosystems, but also as a regulator of our climate. We mobilize, empower young people to take actions within their communities and ensure that the most vulnerable are not only consulted, but are also part of the development, implementation and monitoring processes. So far through mangrove planting initiatives that we conduct, we have planted over 50,000 mangrove plants working with communities and villages throughout the country. And all this in efforts to strengthen and build natural buffers, mitigate the effects of climate crisis. And because we know that mangrove ecosystem is a breeding ground for marine, many marine organisms, which our people depend on for food. We also undertake monthly closed coastal cleanup activities that raise awareness on ocean pollution and host Talanoa sessions to discuss how communities can work together to address ocean pollution and ocean change. We also use the large amount of rubbish that we collect from the cleanup campaigns to make unique forms of artwork, which are then displayed in a public arena during occasions such as the Fiji Eight Hour celebrations. Art is one of the most creative and visible forms of communication that can help highlight the current global concerns, such as the climate crisis, in a unique way. And I strongly believe that a visual message makes it much more appealing and in turn has a stronger cognitive impact in changing mindsets as compared to complex data or information which may often get ignored. Members of the Alliance for Future Generations Fiji were also instrumental in policy change. In early 2016, a major ban the plastic campaign was led by young people and later gained support from CSOs. It called for the complete phase out of single use plastics in Fiji. The campaign then saw the government in its 2017 budget announce steps to completely phase out single use plastics by 2020. The government also implemented a 10 cents levy on each single use plastics that had increased to 20 cents to discourage consumers from using single use plastics and increase awareness for the use of recyclable bags. Early this year, Fiji has completely phased out single use plastics with less than 50 microns in thickness. We also organized a major campaign last year in partnership with 350 Fiji in support of the global September Climate Action Week. In a place like Fiji, it is very important to take into account the political and cultural context before organizing. So in light of this, we localize the events in the context of Fiji to create visibility amongst young people to support the global movement. We call it the New Power Festival, with the word new spelled as N-I-U meaning coconut, which is viewed as the tree of life in the Pacific, and power, which is spelled as P-A-W-A, representing people taking back power and building resilience. As such, our mantra for the event was, we are not drowning, we are fighting. It was the first of its kind in Fiji and was completely a youth-led initiative. On the day, we organized a beach cleanup campaign, mangrove planting, information booths, presentations, demonstrations, and performances by local artists. We once again incorporated art as the fundamental means to engage and inspire young people during the event. This is because not many leaders, politicians, or communicators managed to bring up a relevant topic that is in the back of people's mind and depict it in a way that is engaging while simultaneously representing generally accepted values. The campaign was a success and a, more minutes. the campaign was a success and we believe that art is an effective form of activism, especially within the Pacific, since it's, it is ingrained within the cultural system. From our experience, organizing in Fiji is successful when we empower the local people and communities to use what they already have in order to bring about the change that we want. There are still gaps and lack of coherence between policies, implementation and monitoring in the region when it comes to enforcement and regulation of laws to protect our oceans. Ocean litter and pollution also remains to be an issue in the Pacific. Um, and this requires work on attitudinal and behavioral change. We also recognize the critical role oceans have to play. In fact, has played for generations for our people. As such, we hope to mobilize urgent collective action by all stakeholders in the ocean's well-being, including governments, the United Nations system, CSOs, NGOs, academia, the private sector, and the local communities. We also hope to raise global consciousness on the state of the ocean and the need for humanity to take remedial action during the Oceans Conference. The experience and skills amongst our nations are vast and diverse. Let us all share capacities, technologies, and resources to increase the momentum towards ocean action. 
I'll finish here by saying that we are the first generation to feel the effect, real impacts of climate change, but we are also the last generation to be able to do something about it. Sea level is rising and it's time that we do as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ali, and thank you very much on highlighting the importance to see the conservation of the ocean, our fight for climate action, and also the biodiversity as one set of work. Um, Ambassador has said, Ambassador Thompson has said at one point that we have three problems, the biodiversity, the climate, and the ocean, but we need one set of solutions. So. Um, I would like to thank all panelists, uh, ask them to turn off their microphones and cameras now. Um, thank them very much for their very insightful presentation, uh, which they have set the tone for our discussion today. And actually, I'm very pleased to see how much interaction we already have in the chat. So with this background, we will proceed to the interactive dialogue segment of the program. And uh, during the registration progress, uh, process, some of you have indicated your intention to speak on behalf of your organizations. And um, uh, selected speakers from different constituencies will now be invited to take the floor. Just a small reminder, please, that given the limited time that we have available today, we are asking you to keep your intervention in no more than two minutes. So you give the opportunity to engage as many stakeholders as possible and as possible leaving no one behind. When you are called to speak, uh, please unmute your microphone, turn your camera on, and we kindly ask you to turn the camera off and to mute your microphone once you finish your intervention. And I would like now to welcome our first intervention from the floor, which is Miss Marina Hansen from the Sea Separate Australia Marine Debris Campaign. Uh, Miss Hansen, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning from Australia. Um, for those who don't know, Sea Shepherd is a marine conservation non-government organisation who operates um, onshore campaigns and offshore campaigns around um, the globe. Um, in Australia, we absolutely love our beaches and it's no wonder with more than 36,000 kilometres of coastline and some of the world's most remarkable ecosystems and marine wildlife. Um, but sadly, like so many places on the planet, um, we're too impacted by marine plastic pollution. Four years ago, Sea Shepherd Australia um, launched a national marine debris campaign to address the issue with a focus on plastic. Um, and through the campaign, we engage and empower the broader community through education and direct action at their local beaches or rivers. So what started out as three volunteers organising a clean-up once a month it's now grown um, to inspire over 28,000 members of the public to join with us and be part of a movement to free our oceans of plastic. On the campaign, we have a saying that um, you can't manage what you don't measure. And at the 688 cleanups um, together that we've done with the community, we've not only removed three million pieces of marine debris, but together, and it's very important, together we've documented every piece too. Um, and on an average, um, around about 80% of it is plastic. Um, the fuel for our events, um, it's all about passionate people power and bringing people together. Um, whilst the majority of our beach cleanups are with local community members and they reveal mostly land-based consumer plastics, our annual remote cleanup partnership with the Indigenous Rangers from the Dimmeroo Aboriginal Corporation in Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory. Um, it shockingly highlights just how plastic and fishing nets travel the oceans from faraway places like Southeast Asia. Um, this area has been devastated by plastic pollution, which we um, have documented in a short film called um, Untrashing Julpan. So with all the evidence, um, we advocate for change with a wide range of stakeholders and um, of all ages, pretty much anybody who will listen, and that we know um, through the positive differences of the plastic bag bans here in Australia and on our coastline, we're strong advocates for mandatory product stewardship legislation 
um, that's consistent in Australia, across the region and around the globe. And that will hopefully really drive the change um, that our oceans need. So for us to clean up our oceans and our rivers, we feel that we all must come together with a great focus on stemming the tide of plastic in our oceans and to build a sustainable future for us all. Thank you very much for today. Thank you, Ms. Hansen, for your uh, intervention. Our following speaker is Mr. Maud Taha Ahmad, representing the Pune Institute of Management Sciences and Entrepreneurship in India. Mr. Maud, the floor is yours for two minutes. Thank you very much. For, uh, good morning from India. I hope that you have listened to me. Am I audible? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Please proceed. Oceans are the largest water bodies on Earth. It has been subjected to a lot of pollution over the last few decades. Pollution caused decrease uh, surplus human activities have severely affected the marine life you know, in the ocean. Ocean pollution on, or marine pollution is spreading of, of various harmful substances such as oil, plastic, industrial, agricultural waste, chemical, particles, etc. Uh, the three main uh, rivers, as far as India is concerned, like it's Ganga, Indus, and Brahmaputra, it's constitute 90% of the plastic of the world in the ocean. There are a whole lot of strategic implications and applications that has to be take place as far as India is concerned in order uh, to remove those harmful waste and substances that lands up into the sea and oceans specifically. Uh, the, as far as Asia and India-Pacific, Asia-Pacific uh, Asia are concerned, there are sewage problems, industrial chemicals, nuclear waste problems, uh, plastics, which is the major concern oil spills and oil all over the primary cause of ocean pollution. Uh, ocean mining is also a factor which is also high. Uh, as far as every year, thousands of marine flora and flora got destroyed. Uh, as far as Indian uh, countries is concerned, uh, there are initiatives which has been taken place by government of India, but it has to be uh, have a whole lot of uh, uh, our, our different approach has to be uh, taken place. There are collaboration of India with Germany, collaboration with recent collaboration with Norway in, in order to have a most profound strategic approach. Uh, as far as Indian government is concerned, Prime Minister has come up with Swachh Bharat Abhiyan in 2014, uh, which is a campaign which has a wide scope to cover issues of air pollution based management plastic bans. Uh, there are additional measures which have been taking place, but which has to be taken place in a more profound manner, like ban of single-use plastic, recycling and use of water waste man management, promote recycling and use of oil, and other institute and legal framework that has to be applied. Uh, the model which I convey uh, to this uh, speech is to idea, uh, de development and generation, innovate. Mr. Mode, uh, time in please. Imitate and implement model. This has to be applied as far as India is concerned. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Maud. Um, I will uh, now invite Ms. Yvonne Yu from the United Nations University, the Institute for Advanced Studies of Sustainability in Japan, uh, to make her intervention. Ms. Uh, Yvonne, the floor is yours. Thank you, colleagues. Um, a very good afternoon from Tokyo. The Satoyama Initiative of the United Nations University would like to encourage Asia-Pacific nations to take an integrated landscape approach in implementing the ocean action that emphasizes on land-sea connectivity issues and the impacts of land-based activities on coastal ecosystems. While coastal ecosystems are important cradles of coastal and marine biodiversity, where we depend on for food and livelihoods, but as also buffer areas for mitigating climate change impacts. However, coastal ecosystems are affected by upstream land-based activities and impacts also brought about by incoming ocean currents. Thus, they are highly vulnerable to effects of pollution, climate change, and overuse. Recent studies suggest 90% of marine debris remains in the coastal land and sea areas. Therefore, we need to achieve a holistic upstream to downstream or 
reach to reef integrated landscape approach for ocean action by promoting the understanding and giving more emphasis on the impact of land-based activities on our coastal ecosystems. So Asia Pacific nations are encouraged to work together and with independent experts and organizations to develop more ambitious strategies for integrated coastal management. And this would enable effective involvement of stakeholders from different sectors, and especially those that are not traditional um, interest holders of ocean issues. This will then facilitate the real mainstreaming of ocean action across various sectors and all levels of governance. Emphasizing on land sea connectivity will also then justify and promote linkages between SDGs 14 and SDGs. Lastly, tackling marine pollution and climate change needs the international collaboration of not only littoral states, but also inland countries with waterways. So all Asia Pacific nations could then promote active information exchange and joint research on marine issues and ocean studies. The UNU will be happy to support Asia Pacific nations in taking ocean action. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Yu. And um, uh, let's move now from the great island um, nation of Japan to another great island nation, uh, Philippines, and uh, welcome Mr. Harlan uh, <coughs> Bangai of the project Marik Knows in the Philippines. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bangai, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning everyone. I hope all of you are staying safe and healthy. Um, an LGBT member in the seafarer or maritime industry might not be an earned off, but it is definitely rare. I'm a proud LGBT marine engineering graduate or aspiring seafarer. Imagine knowing that my profession should go beyond just technicalities, that it should be at the front lines of um, marine conservation. We have 53,732 ships in the world, and the shipping industry is the bloodline of the world trade and economy. And did the participants ever know here that notice activities of ships, the environmental impacts of shipping, like ballasting, marine pollution litter, noise pollution, wildlife collisions, ship emissions, or oil pollutions, or also in by impacts of ports and the lack of regard for the maritime pollution and access by seafarers and our maritime professionals. So I started Project Marinos with the hopes of creating systematic change and helping the maritime industry champion mitigative, legislative, and adaptive positive environmental actions against annoyed shipping practices. As Philippines rank second of producers of seafarers and officers around the world, um, my organization wanted to empower maritime professionals and students in the Philippines as leaders in marine protection. So it also aims to educate mar marine conservation effectively and to encourage and guide them about the current and most pressing issues about the mentioned um, problems earlier about um, impacts of shipping and ports and etc. So that they will enrich their knowledge and skills through this organic and to preserve and protect our ocean, the maritime domain, the marine environment while on board in port and to ensure the sustainable development and future operation of the maritime industry. Because the ocean is in all its meaning our life, our source of income, and our home as a seafarer. So I hope that the UN officials here, speakers, and this UN conference 2020 will also prioritize and help us to support and call for sustainable shipping and especially empowering the maritime professionals and students around the world because we cannot achieve the SDG 14 if we only focus on land projects. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bangai, and thank you very much for reinforcing the message that ocean is life, it's our life. Uh, and uh, let's now move to the uh, country that uh, we are hosted, Thailand. Uh, and give the floor to Ms. Barbara Ewells, which um, she will speak on, on behalf of the Initiative for Global Resilience. The floor is yours, Ms. Uh, Ewells. Hi, uh, good morning here from Thailand, and uh, I'm glad to be able to speak with regards to uh, what the Initiative for Global Resilience is doing. Basically, we believe that uh, in the 2015 report of the nonprofit of Ocean Conservancy noted that 50 to 60 percent of plastic waste uh, are entering the ocean comes from just five countries, four of which are in the ASEAN region. China, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. The debris kills marine life and is broken down into microparticles that make their way into seafood eaten by humans. 
it is so ubiquitous that in 2018, a research institute in Austria found an average of 20 pieces of microplastics per 20 grams of human feces. This makes the effort to mitigate ocean debris even more urgent in the ASEAN member states and why they have signed the declaration combating ocean debris in Bangkok last year. However, the coronavirus pandemic has not only wreaked havoc uh, on public health-wise, but also undermined whatever gains um, the Asia-Pacific member states have been working on to mitigate their pollution efforts, which a big part of it is plastic use. Thailand has reported an increase of 15% of plastic waste during this lockdown period, and we can safely assume that the other member states are experiencing the same increase, if not more. To stem this problem requires partnerships from all stakeholders to work in concert. Not only do we need to ramp up investments in infrastructure and collect and recycle waste, but also we need to make an impact on plastic use. We believe that the key to unlocking the key to this is unlocking the true value of plastics so that it will be used sparingly and um, become too important to be thrown away needlessly. We need innovative and sustainable systems to pay the public for plastic waste, as this will not only stem the tide on plastic use, but also improve conditions of collectors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ewells, for your important lesson. And uh, really, the numbers you are sharing with us uh, are scary, and it's a call for further action. We will, I will now invite uh, Mr. Giotiraz Patra from the Oxfam office in Cambodia to intervene. Please go ahead, Mr. Patra. Thank you. Distinguished delegates and moderator, thank you for the opportunity. I'm speaking on behalf of Transboundary Rivers of South Asia, TROSA, a regional governance partnership project of 15 civil society organizations, research institutes and think tanks, working on inclusive water governance initiatives in the transboundary Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna, and Salwin basins in South and Southeast Asia. Through my intervention, I aim to highlight the increasing export of plastic debris by some of the major transboundary rivers in Asia and the need for regional water cooperation mechanisms to include and address plastic debris load and pollution in the shared waters to reduce marine plastic pollution. There is growing scientific evidence that land-based sources and rivers contribute substantially to marine plastic pollution. A global analysis of plastic debris load identified 10 major river systems that transport 88 to 95 percent of the global load into the sea. Eight of them are in Asia, and six of them are transboundary in nature, flowing across political boundaries. This highlights the need for major water cooperation mechanism in transboundary river systems. There is growing recognition for more source to sea and regional approach. The existing transboundary water cooperation mechanisms, whether bilateral or multilateral in the Asia Pacific region, should recognize plastic pollution and debris load, including those of mismanaged plastic waste in these river catchments and initiate basin-wide multi-stakeholder dialogues for greater transboundary cooperation on plastic pollution. I also take this opportunity to emphasize the role and contribution of civil society organizations in our collective endeavor to reduce marine plastic pollution. CSOs and other regional networks, particularly those uh, which are led by women and youth, can further mobilize more participation of communities and citizens, including change in social norms and consumption practices for a more plastic-free economy. I thank you once again for this opportunity to contribute. Thank you very much, Mr. Patra. And indeed, the CSO community is about participation, but it's also many times, and we have seen extremely good results of action from the CSO. Um, we will now turn to Ms. Runa Ray, who will uh, share some insights into the impact of fashion on the ocean, representing the Moyo Design Studios in India. And I'm particularly interesting to hear her intervention because the fashion industry has been identified 
environmental degradation. Uh, Ms. Ray, the floor is yours. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear and see you very well. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm extremely honored to speak at the United Nations Ocean Conference series of Keeping the Momentum of Ocean Action. I belong to the field of fashion and my company uses the principles of reduce, reuse and recycle, saying which we have put together a series of processes for micro organizations to employ to help them identify the area of production that creates the most amount of carbon footprint and help mitigate those by adhering to the SDGs. Fashion is a great contributor when it comes to climate change, which in turn affects our seas. There's plastic being used in packaging as well as clothes, which result in microfibers being released into the oceans at every wash. From production to consumer, this creates a plastic circular economy. And with the fish ingesting it, it ends up on our dinner plates. Some of the processes that we have created for the small scale and micro organizations to help mitigate climate change are as follows. Extraction of natural dyes from discarded flower markets to replace synthetic plastic dyes. Working with indigenous and coastal communities which creates a cross-pollination of environmentally friendly ideas of production and trade. Creation of innovative methods of recycling the garment, either into paper or fodder for crops, so that they do not end up polluting the seas through the landfills. Helping organizations educate the customer on how many times to wash the garment and the use of a lint bag when it comes to synthetic clothing to help mitigate microfiber release help identify the transparency in the supply chain to make better choices from land-based activities. Use of traditional crafts such as floating inks that can arrest water pollution and its wastage. While all these processes that are listed and there are more to come, they're in adherence with the SDGs and to help reduce fashion's impact on the oceans. For, for us in the, fashion, um, in the fashion fraternity, innovation is key and less is more. And while we are responsible for our own waste management, I request that we also, the other countries do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ray. And we indeed need to see leadership from the fashion industry because it's not only a productive activity that is using resources, but at the same time, it's um, a one that is shaping lifestyles of consumers and uh, all the people. Uh, we would now like to welcome Mr. Peter Sova, representing the Common Seas, a philanthropic organization in the UK with projects in Maldives and Indonesia. Mr. Sova, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear and see me okay? We can hear and see you very well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. So thank you, esteemed panel members and participants, for the opportunity to speak today. I represent Common Seas, a non-profit on a mission to quickly and significantly reduce the amount of plastic produced and stop it polluting our rivers and seas. We do this by driving government policy through the provision of technical assistance and by creating circular solutions, enabling economic opportunities. In parallel, we work to create cultural changes focused on health and education to entrench our solutions at all levels and with all stakeholders. What this means in practice is taking exceptionally complex systems, such as the massively polluting rivers of Asia, and distilling one target, such as the Brantes in Indonesia. Once we've done this, we target the most impactful pollutant, in this case, single-use diapers, and design solutions that achieve the desired outcomes. We're currently doing this in Surabaya, where we're working to reduce the 1.7 million diapers thrown into the Brantes per day by creating a cost-effective and circular diaper, as well as a secure waste management system. The new diaper is produced by local mothers through partnership with the largest community organization in the region, increasing their household income and purchasing power. The waste management system is done in partnership with local governments and ensures that both the reusable and single-use diapers are part of the circular system. At the same time, we're working with both sets of organizations to create an education program and a campaign on the health risk of plastic escapement to the environment. I'm here to encourage your participation in our work and offer our support to yours. We always seek meaningful partnerships, funders, and experts. Please feel free to contact me at this event. I look forward to meeting you all in person once we're able to do that again. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sovell, and uh, good luck uh, for your uh, various projects. I would like now to welcome Ms. CJ from the Environmental Protection Center in Guangzhou, China. 
Miss Z, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, Good morning. We can see and hear you. Me about data gates. China. During past dictation had become global. Uh, Miss Z, your microphone has some interruptions. Yes, we can hear you now. If you could talk closer to the microphone, please. In order to reduce marine plastic pollution, we should reduce the problem of plastic waste pollution at the source. To develop efficient, rapid, environmentally friendly, and high recovering technology for green chemical waste plastics. As a student, we should pay attention to the issue related to marine plastics, cooperate with university enterprises and, G and NGOs to explore marine plastic-free solutions, research and develop technologies for the interception and degradation of microplastics in sewage treatment. A garbage classification also paid significant role. It helps China to reduce marine plastic waste at the source. Additionally, the youth organizations have, have made our own efforts. We organize the voluntary activities to protect marine uh, mangroves and encourage young people to participate in beach cleaning activities. Uh, we're trying to change the marine environment in our own way. Thank you for listening. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. J, and thank you for outlining some very practical uh, things that we can all do to reduce plastic pollution. I would like now to give the floor to Mr. Masanori Kobayashi from the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Japan. Mr. Kobayashi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I concur with the many speakers uh, who underline the need to bolster our efforts to reduce marine plastic by substituting alternative materials for plastic and lay out the milestones with short and medium term goals. I add that uh, um, I see many landfills, particularly in East Asia, that are located in the coastal areas. And that was one of the reasons why there is increase in marine plastic litters. In this context, I find a need uh, to include the risks of marine plastics uh, in the environmental risk assessment to avoid the setup of the landfill site in the coastal areas. I also wanted to add on this ocean and the climate issues, as we need to address them in the context of promoting sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 impact. We have introduced some of the measures and the changed our lifestyle and business models to deal with the COVID-19. And it would be very important to build upon them toward achieving sustainable development, particularly that resulted in the reduction of fossil fuel use. We have to be flexible to deal with the dynamic and unexpected changes and emergency situations. We need to be right on the track for sustainable development uh, we also need to reinforce adaptive management of the environment and natural resources as we now need to incorporate additional factors in our environment and natural resource management. In our adaptive management, we need to address not only climate change and other changes of the environment and natural resource use, but also the recovery of the COVID-19 impacts and the reduction of health and the socioeconomic risks of the future infection diseases. Interdisciplinary science and the multi-stakeholder partnership will continue to be important in overcoming such challenges as we need to address more factors and risks, risks in pursuing the achievement of SDG 14 and other goals. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Kobayashi. And we will turn now to Dr. Denise 
had stayed from the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Australia. Dr. Denise, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I appreciate everyone's time and attention here in this meeting. I think I want to ask us to step back for just a moment. And while, yes, I will speak very briefly about what we're doing at CSIRO, I also want to acknowledge a couple of key components. And one, in the first instance, is the COVID response. We know, as some have mentioned in the chat and on some of these presentations, that we are seeing pushback from some petroleum companies. At the same time, we're seeing PepsiCo and Coca-Cola making an announcement supporting a tax or a levy on plastic. And as we move forward into a post-COVID world, I think we want to make sure that we're working closely with industry, with governments, with on-ground partners to improve our circularity in the products that we use. So I'm very excited to hear many of the presentations that we are hearing today about diapers, about fashion, about many of these such important issues. I'd also encourage us to be thinking about a plastic circular economy rather than a plastic free economy because we all acknowledge the role that some types of plastics have for some purposes. And I would encourage us to be focusing on the power of information and data. We know that data is critical in having those baseline information against which governments can measure the success of activities and actions is fundamentally important. We are focusing on a 90% target reduction for plastic waste leaking into the environment, and we see important opportunities in the regions that align with the areas of behavioral change, revolutionizing packaging, supporting best practices, and data or decision making alongside waste innovation. At the same time, I would ask us to all acknowledge that critically important role that the informal recycling sector plays in helping to manage and stop waste from entering the ocean. Those communities are often marginalized and yet they are fundamentally important to include as we discuss opportunities and solutions for improved livelihoods and for social justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise, for combating so many important messages in two minutes. And definitely we would like to work more with CSIRO um, on, on tackling the uh, plastic pollution. And let me here um, echo uh, your message on uh, the behavior of the oil companies. And uh, let me also remind uh, what the United Nations Secretary General asked a couple of weeks ago in the Petersburg Climate Dialogue when he explicitly uh, said, let's stop uh, subsidies on fossil fuels. And he didn't say let's rationalize or let's reduce. He said, let's stop subsidies in fossil fuels. And he also asked for a carbon tax uh, to be able to uh, manage the, the climate crisis. I would, like, I would now give the floor to Ms. Uh, Melanie Austin of the Blue Communities Program. Uh, Ms. Austin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Blue Communities Programme. Uh, we have research partners across Southeast Asia Pacific. And our programme is funded by the UK Grand Challenges Research Fund. We're a research programme built on academic and stakeholder collaborations and community co-creation and co-delivery of research. And through this research, we're supporting sustainable use of marine resources by multiple users, at the same time protecting fragile marine ecosystems and supporting livelihoods, food security, health and well-being of people in the coastal communities. We're a big partnership, a community of over 100 researchers working with local and regional stakeholders. And we work across many disciplines and projects, uh, ranging from governance to remote sensing, ecosystem impacts and ecosystem services, economics, public health, remote sensing, modeling, fisheries, aquaculture, renewable energy, uh, including environmental and behavioral psychology and future scenarios. And our findings so far demonstrate that in the face of global climate change and, and change, including things like COVID, I think, in, as, we see, as we'll see in the future, marine planning and coastal and ocean management really do require interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral understanding and perspectives. 
And it's the interdisciplinary research that's co-created and co-delivered with stakeholders that's going to be essential to successfully identify and address those issues where research can really support ocean action going forward. Building regional interdisciplinary research capability across all of the stakeholders, including our early career researchers, is going to be key to finding those solutions and to reaching the sustainable development goals. So in blue communities, we're working towards building capability to secure that better future by linking the people and nature in Southeast Asia, because we want to get better health, well-being, food and livelihoods for the coastal communities. And we do think that this interdisciplinary approach, and I've heard it mentioned before uh, throughout many of the interventions and the earlier speakers, is, is so important to take the oceans forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Austin. Um, the last uh, intervention will be from Mr. Rituraj Pukan. Mr. Pukan, the floor is yours for two minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, I am presenting on behalf of uh, Parbati.org. And uh, it's about the Marine Arctic Peace Sanctuary, which is a proposed uh, treaty that has already been endorsed by a few countries. So maps. The Marine Arctic Peace Sanctuary declares the Arctic Ocean, north of the Arctic Circle, an international peace park, free from exploitation of all kinds, in perpetuity. It prohibits all activities harmful to the health of the vulnerable Arctic Ocean ecosystem and its sea ice. MAPS not only protects the uh, fragile Arctic Ocean ecosystem, which has been a peace park for thousands of years by its very nature, it also safeguards the remaining sea ice from damage by exploitation, helping to keep the planet cool. It also helps to prevent natural disasters such as floods, forest, uh, forest fires, sorry, uh, floods and droughts. Uh, MAPS also compels a global shift away from fossil fuels to sustainable energy. Yeah. It declares our global commitment to sustainable energies and our cessation of the use of fossil fuels by saying no to offshore Arctic oil and gas. We aim to unite world leaders in the commitment to value long-term collective good over short-term individual gain. MAPS unites world leaders in agreement to no longer put short-term gain ahead of long-term consequence. MAPS protects people. Extreme weather connected with the loss of uh, polar ice is uh, causing crop failures and food shortages. MAPS helps establish global weather and preserves everyone access to the basic need necessities of life, preventing a key source of conflict. MAPS also supports renewable energies by taking Arctic oil off the table for good. MAPS compels a global shift to renewable energies, changing the game for our world. MAPS protects nature. MAPS is by far the largest marine conservation area in history. The entire Arctic Ocean, north of the Arctic Circle, MAPS also helps mitigate sea level rise and protects ecosystems all over the world from disasters weather. MAPS supports peace. MAPS compels an end to territorial disputes within the Arctic Ocean and promotes global peace and stability. Educating the public about the need for MAPS means touching hearts and inspiring minds with the power of peace and compassion. Uh, we transform the world together. Uh, that's about it. If you want to know more, please visit parvati.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pukan. And um, uh, with your intervention and the call to take oil off the table, uh, we have reached the end uh, of our program. Uh, please, uh, the ones not speaking now, turn off your cameras and mute your microphones. Um, we see uh, a lot of inputs in the chat box, uh, but due to the time, we will be unable to take further interventions. However, we have taken note of all your comments and questions and your contributions today will really help to keep the momentum alive as we prepare for the OCEAN conference. Um, rest assured also that your inputs will be reflected in the ongoing preparatory work of the OCEAN conference as ESCAP continues to voice the concerns of our region and all stakeholders in our region to showcase all the impactful work of uh, the governments and all stakeholders in Asia and the Pacific. For your information, all materials and the recording of this session will be available on the website uh, later this week. 
I would like to thank all speakers and participating organizations connected from uh, 50 countries for your engagement in this webinar. We are very happy to see that the momentum for ocean action is very much alive and unstoppable in Asia and the Pacific. Asia and the Pacific should be the champion for the conservation and protection of the ocean, and we want to make sure that ESCAP can support governments and all stakeholders to be these challenges. We encourage you to monitor the UN Ocean Conference website regularly so you can find new developments and eventually the new date of the conference in which we all looking forward. I would like to thank very much UNDESA for organizing and co-hosting this webinar with ESCAP. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, Ambassador Thompson for the support and thank all of you participants and viewers for your commitments to the protection of the ocean. We, I would like to have two appointments and, and two uh, milestones that we can meet all together. One would be the Asia Pacific Day for the Ocean, which we are planning for 11 December this year, if the situation will allow us to have a physical meeting. Even if we don't have a physical meeting, for sure we will organize a number of virtual consultations and an event for the Day of the Ocean. But keep in your calendar, please, the December 11 as the day for the ocean for Asia and the Pacific. And of course, the second one will be once we know the date, the Lisbon conference. So see you in December in Bangkok for the day for the ocean and see you in Lisbon at the UN Offense conference. Thank you very much.